Anyway, anyway, uh, he was my friend. So, all right, Revelation chapter number two. The church in Thyatira. Uh, what a now this covers uh, this church. Now they're they're literally historically uh, was a church in this in in Asia Minor called Thyatira. Okay, and so he's writing this letter to them. But this letter is about a period in church history. We can look back and see all these things. And this one, uh, you'll see in here, it goes from verse 18 all the way down to verse 29, 11 verse. It covers more probably than all the rest of them, but it covers more time. It covers from about 500 A.D. to somewhere between 1300 and 1500, okay? And so it covers uh, about 1,000 years. It covers a lot of time. Now, this, uh, this word Thyatira means odor of affliction. And that's what it means. It means that God is aware that the church is being afflicted during this time. Let's read this, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like uh, unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father." And I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, obviously, when, when, when uh, John is writing this, notice he says, well, he ends this, it, and it kind of gives us a little bit of clue that he's not talking just to one church, which tells us that this church time, this, that we can all learn from this church period right here, because he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This to all the churches, right? Now, God uses this one right here during this time, uh, back in that time, but it is a type, a picture of uh, this church period. This, we're broken up into seven church periods, and then next I think we got Sardis, uh, and then we have probably uh, Philadelphia, and then we have Laodicea, so just a couple of more will be done with the church age. But this is the largest time frame right here. This is during the Great Persecution or the Dark Ages. Uh, from about 500 to about 1500, 1300 to 1500. These dates are not exact. Uh, but he says, under the angel of the church in Thyatira, right, these things saith the Son of God. So no doubt about it who it is that's talking here. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now you can look over here in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 14 and 15, where he tell verse number 12, which said, he says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden, seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool. Now that's what the risen Savior looks like. This is what the Lord looks like now. He don't have the physical body no more. This, that thing is gone. That, that physical body served its purpose, just like mine and yours is serving its purpose. But he said his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And so we know, uh, no doubt about it, uh, who it is that's talking right here. And he says in verse number 19, I know thy works, 
So here we have another church that's actually working. Now, right here he's talking in, in verse number 19. These are the good things that he's telling them. Because in verse 20 he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. So uh, first of all, he, he talks about, he says, I know thy works. And like we've said the last couple of weeks, you know, God knows the works of the church. And he says, and charity. Church ought to have charity, right? The Bible teaches us in, I think, 1 Corinthians, he said, and if we have not charity, we're a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, right? We, uh, the church ought to have charity. Now, charity is love. Charity, but charity is not just love. Charity is showing the love of Christ through people. That's what it is. Right after, uh, I'd never spent a, a, a whole, a complete multiple nights in the, in the hospital in my whole life until God called me to preach. <laughs> and I, I surrendered to preach, and then that's when I started. I never took medication until then that I was supposed to take anyway, and uh, that I had prescription for. But, but I got on medication, and, and, uh, and then uh, I got sick one time. And I spent, how many, 12 days in the hospital or something like that, and Tiffany was off work, and, and uh, uh, I had just, I hadn't been saved, but what, just a few months, I guess. And, and, uh, and so I spent that time in the hospital, well, and so I hadn't worked in a couple weeks, and she had missed a lot of work, and, and I had meningitis is what I had. Uh, is that what they decided it was, meningitis? And so one night, I wasn't even able to go to church. I was just so weak, all that stuff. I was taking IVs. Uh, a nurse come by twice a day or once a day and give me IV antibiotics and all this stuff. And, and so one night, Brother Johnny Wright, one dear friend that I grew up with, came to the house after church one Sunday night. And he had a big old wad of cash in his hand. And I said, what's that? He said, the church took up a love offering, and uh, we want you to have it. And, uh, and I said, well, I don't want charity. And he looked at me, he said, what is charity? Of course, our pastor had already taught us what charity is. Charity suffereth long. Charity is not puffed up. Charity, you know, tell us about what charity is. Charity is showing the love of Christ to other people. That's what charity is. It's a sacrificial giving of yourself love that we show uh, the love of Jesus Christ. And so it's not just a handout. That's the way we take today. But, but this church right here, they was a given church. And, and he said, I know thy works and charity and service. And faith, when it, ain't it something whenever Christ points out the faith of a church? Amen. And thy patience, and thy works. Now notice he says, and the last to be more than the first. He said, you're a working church. You, you're doing the right things. And, and uh, the, the church is obviously growing and things like that. Now, verse number 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Now we're fixing to get into some stuff right here. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, uh, this, this obviously, this church in Thyatira, they was having a problem with these things. That's why God wrote. They was obviously, there's somebody in there, what they needed was a pastor. What they needed was a pastor that, that, that had some spine and a pastor that had some guts that he can tell that woman, you're going to sit down, you're going to hush. Hey, man, where's your husband at, ma'am, anyway? Hey, man, say, would you say something to a lady like that around here? Well, Jezebel wasn't no lady, first of all. And if she was teaching this kind of stuff, I've done it before. Whenever we first started up here, um, I, I don't know, we've probably been here a year or two, I guess, something like that. And I got sick one morning. I woke up, and I was throwing up. And, I mean, it was just bad. And, and so I called my son-in-law, Rod, and I said, hey, can you come up from Arkansas? It's 4 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. Can you come up and preach for me Sunday morning, Sunday night? And he's like, yeah. So they got up and got around. They'd come up here. And there was a woman going to church here at the time. And, and after church was over, she cornered him up in the back and was telling him everything he preached wrong. And uh, I thought, hmm. Well, then come to find out that some people that got saved here and got baptized and joined the church, she had went to them behind my back and was telling them that I wasn't doing it right. And I said, well, anyway, that ain't happening around here. Amen. And so uh, anyway, one Sunday morning after I got well, come back, I said, I said, I need to have a talk with you. And uh, I said, matter of fact, well, I just do it right here. And I said, when you get to this church, I said, you don't speak to nobody but me and my wife. She wasn't a member. I said, you get out of your vehicle. You come in here and you find a seat and you sit down and you don't talk to nobody except for me and my wife. I said, as a matter of fact, you don't even speak to my wife. I said, you come in and sit down and I'm the only person you can talk to. And uh, boy, she got all upset and left out of here crying. I thought, well, 
fine. Amen. Anyway, and uh, because you're not going to have that. I got a real good preacher friend of mine. There was a man in his church just recently that was going around behind his back and was saying some stuff and was questioning things he preached to, to other people. Now, if you've got a question about something I preach, please come and ask me about it. We'll sit down and talk about it. I'm not all, the Bible's always right, but I may not always be right. I may miss something. I may miss something you're seeing. So if, if there's a dispute between something I'm saying and something the Scripture says, I encourage you to come to me. Let's sit down and talk about it. But I wouldn't go to everybody else first. That's right. That's right. And so this preacher friend of mine, he told that man, he said, that's not how that goes around here. I mean, you're not going to go around and sow discord. You're not going to go around and question everything. I wouldn't do that to you. I mean, if, 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 if Brother Nathan got up here and, and, and said something, or Brother Sean, or Brother Noble, or, or anybody, or teaching, or singing, or out, I'm not going to go around behind your back and all this kind of stuff. I have a long list of people that you could call and verify. i got references that if I have a problem or a question, I'll call you. <laughs> hey, man, i got a, I got a whole list of people that you could call. But anyway, but anyway, let's just move on and get away from that. But notwithstanding, I have a few, what they needed was a pastor. That's what I meant to say. Did I say that? What they needed was a pastor, amen, to stand up and say, look, that's false doctrine, that's wrong, you're not doing that here, we'd love for you to be here, but you're going to behave yourself while you're here. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now, uh, she calleth herself a prophetess, but she's claiming to be something that she's not. She's claiming authority and a gift and things that, that, uh, that, that she don't really have. Uh, I know some other people like that too. I had a conversation with one just this past week. They got mad at me whenever I told them they was being deceitful. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine somebody getting upset with me for telling them you're being deceitful. Anyway, oh, by the way, about two hours after that conversation, Brother Trent, I get a text. I, they said, I got one more question. Are you by chance employed by Highway Missionary Baptist Church? I said, I am the pastor. Hey, Amen. Oh, well, just making friends. Just making friends. <laughs> yes? Is, is this the same, the same uh, doctrine of Balaam that's kind of carried over? Yes. Is still, still present in this church age? Absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, you can look over here in verse number 14. And the Pergamos, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught uh, Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. <laughs> and we're going to go back here in just a minute. As a matter of fact, while we're, while we're talking about it, let's go, go to Revelation chapter 17 before we, before we go any further. We're going to draw a line, this doctrine, we're going to draw a line all the way from Genesis all the way up to Revelation. This is not a new doctrine. This thing has been going on a long time, all the, way, all the way back. So go to Revelation chapter number 17. And it may shock you uh, whenever I show you some of this stuff in the Scripture. You're going to recognize some religions today that do these very things. And I'm not going to call no names. I'm just going to read the Scripture. And then you can decide for yourself. I mean, I could. I have before. I'm not afraid to. But I'm not going to. I'm going to let you decide from the Scripture. But anyway, Revelation chapter number 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now that many waters is people, okay? We'll get to this when we get to Revelation chapter 17. With whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication. So the kings, so the rulers are involved with this spiritual whore, okay? Uh... And the inhabitants of the earth have been made uh, drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now that's spiritual, okay. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and uh, scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So she's beautiful and very wealthy having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and uh, filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, uh, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration." 
Now that admiration would be like amazement. That admiration is not I admired as in aspired to be like her, but it's I was amazed uh, by what I saw. Okay, now you see right here where it says, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, uh, a lot of people, you know, through the, through the Roman Colosseum and things like that, more people were martyred during this dark ages, this 500. So there's a correlation to the church in Thyatira, that church age, with this great whore of Babylon here, okay? And so, uh, which is Jezebel, all right? Now, um, so from 500 to 1500, you can read the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, it is outlawed in the United States of America to, te to be taught in a public school as an accurate historical book, okay? Uh, because of its factual truth about martyrs, that Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's, you can get it off Amazon or anywhere. It's, I've got a couple of them somewhere. Um, but anyway, so now let's uh, keep that in mind. Now this Jezebel, all right, uh, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter number 49. I want to I want to draw a line through the scripture for you, just using some scripture and a little uh, Genesis chapter number forty nine. I think you're going to be uh, interested in this. Now, Genesis chapter number forty nine, the blessings of Jacob. Okay, and his twelve so the twelve tribes here. Genesis chapter number forty nine. Verse number 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, okay? An adder in the path that biteth the horses, the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward, okay? Like backsliding because of a serpent, okay? Now, we know what the devil is, don't we? Serpent. Okay. Now, Deuteronomy. Now, keep this in mind. We're drawing a line. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I know it's in here somewhere. I just read it there. Deuteronomy chapter 33. When you get there, say, I... Y'all's already there. Deut ah, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse number <coughs> 22. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. Okay? Now, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says what? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Dan, the tribe of Dan, is compared to a, a lion's whelp, okay, and a serpent, all right? Keep that in mind. Now, go to Judges chapter 18. They were drawing a line. Y'all see the line? Okay, the straight line, Judges chapter 18. We're talking about Jezebel and her religious bunch, right? Teaching false doctrines and things, okay? Judges chapter 18. Now, you can read through Judges chapter 18 right here. Let's look at verse number 1 through 4. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. Well, hold on just a minute now. God already gave them their inheritance. But guess what? They didn't like their inheritance. So they went to a place they shouldn't have been. All right? Now, it messed them up. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And the, Now, if you'll notice, if you'll notice, when you get over there in the book of Revelation, the 144,000, it starts listing 12,000 out of each tribe. Dan is absent. The tribe of Dan is not mentioned. There's a reason for that. All right? Look here, verse number 2. And the children of Dan set of their family five men from their coast, men of valor, from Zorah, from Eshtal, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the land, who, when they came to Mount Ephraim, into the house of Micah, they lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? 
and what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we shall which we go shall be prosperous. And so he goes to tell them, obviously, that yeah, everything's going to be all right. Look at verse number 14. Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish, and said unto their brethren, Do ye know that there is in these houses an ephod, a teraphim, and a graven image, and a molten image? Now therefore consider what ye have to do. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war, which stood, were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering end of the gate. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image, and the priest stood in the entering of the gate with six hundred men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image, and they said, the priest said unto them, What do ye? And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us. Who are they talking to? The priest, okay, that was hired, the hired priest that had the graven images, the idols, okay? So the tribe of Dan, they said, Go with us. And be to us a what? A father and a priest. Now, why would you call a young man a father? It is better for thee to be a priest under the house of one man, or that thou be a priest under the tribe and a family in Israel. So, you have the tribe of Dan who's going to a snake and a lion like a devil. They're not happy where they are, so they move. Okay? And as they move, they purchase a priest and they call him father. Okay, now we're drawing a line. All right, y'all grinning at me. I ain't said a word. I'm just reading the Bible. That's what they done. Okay, now, now look at verse 20. And the priest's heart was glad. Well, sure. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in in the midst of the people. Okay, so there he went with his idols and he incorporates them in the worship. All right. Now, look at verse number 28. Verse number 28 says, And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon. Now, this is important. And they had no business with any man, and it was in the valley that lieth by uh, Beth Rehob, and they built a city and dwelt therein. Okay? They're near Zidon. Okay? So here we have the tribe of Dan. They've left where they're supposed to have been, okay? And they've hired them a priest that has graven images incorporated in worship, and they call him Father, and they go and they settle near Zidon. How about that? So for nearly a thousand years, the tribe of Dan mixes with the Zidonians and Baal worship with this father and his idols, okay? Go to 1 Kings chapter 16. First Kings chapter 16. Mm, now it's about to make sense. Well, it might here in a minute. I'm still, there we go. Nope. I have got the wrong chapter. Just to bear with me a second. Okay. Chap yeah, chapter 16. I don't know where I was. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29. I must have been in 1 Kings chapter 6. Okay, 
And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. Okay, everybody stop reading. All right, so here we have, we have the tribe of Dan. All right, we're drawing a line, okay? They moved from where they're supposed to be, all right? They buy a priest, they call him father. He's a young man, the Bible says. They buy a priest, they call him father, all right? He has idols, and he has graven images. He incorporates them in their worship, and they go and they settle near the land of Zidon, okay? Now, who are we talking about? Who's the woman we're talking about? Jezebel. Watch this, verse number uh, 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat. He took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbel, the king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So, here you got the tribe of Dan, way back to Genesis, all right? Going to be a serpent, all right? Going to be a lion's whelp. They move, they buy a priest, they call him father, okay? Not knowing what they're doing. He incorporates idols, and he incorporates graven images and all this kind of stuff. Go to Second Kings. So, and then, and then, over here in Revelation, God says, look, that woman Jezebel ain't no count. So we're not, we're not strictly talking about a woman. We're also talking about a religion. Hmm. And so tell me what religion grew and conquered and killed, okay, and taught false doctrine between 500 and 1500 A.D.? Does anybody know? Would anybody like to guess? It wasn't Baptist. I mean, I'm not saying Baptists are that good of people. I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not saying you, you give a Baptist enough authority, and they'll be just like anybody. Anytime a man has complete authority, you're going to have complete corruption. I mean, any time you have, that's just the way it is. You've got to let the Bible be your authority, okay? So we're talking about 2 Kings chapter 10. This right here is just kind of a bonus, 2 Kings chapter 10. And later down the line, years later, <laughs> you won't never guess what these, what these Baal priests start wearing that they're calling Father. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse number 22 says this. Now, let's back up to verse number 20. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. Baal's a false god. Okay. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu went through all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal, and he brought them forth vestments. Now, <clears throat> there ain't but one group in the world where their fathers wear vestments. You can Google it. I did. Guess what Catholic priests wear? You'll never... How'd y'all guess? Vestments. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, all right. Well, and then in Jeremiah chapter 44, you can read. We won't turn there and read all of it, but we spent a lot of time on that. But um, you draw your own conclusion from the line that got drawn in the Bible all the way, all the way down through over here to Revelation, you know, where he says, notwithstanding a few things against him, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Um, what he's saying is they were some of the, that, the church, the church, the church should have been stronger during this time what it was. A lot of those, a lot of those churches gave in. They gave in. Because, of, well, I mean, what, and, and what you had, I mean, it's, it, it's human nature what happened, okay? It's human nature. It's easy for us to sit in judgment on the past. 
I mean, really, it is, ain't it? I mean, it's easy for us to say it in judgment on the past, really. But what you had was you had this, you had this, this pagan worship that incorporated idols. In Jeremiah chapter 44, as a matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah uh, talks about this, 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 this Baal worship and all that kind of stuff and mentions the queen of heaven. Okay. Well, now, the popes come out years ago, and, and they, now they refer to Mary as the queen of heaven. So there's a direct correlation. But what you had was, is you had the, 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 the pagan Roman government, okay? So then you had, you had this, this false religious organization, and they just saw an opportunity where you, you can make it the state-run religion, and, and so they could just control people that way. I mean, that's exactly what it was for. It was for control. People do that today. I mean, there's, there's churches, there's pastors that do that today. I'm talking about missionary Baptist preachers that will do that today, and they'll try to control, but the Bible is plain. It says that the, you know, the pastor is an overseer, not being lords over God's heritage. I'm not to lord over the flock. I'm to, I'm to be the spiritual leader and lead by example and to preach, thus saith the Lord in the Bible, but not to be a lord. But if you're not careful, you know, people got to do that. So, but, so it's, like I said, it's easy for us to sit in judgment and all those kind of things. But, um, but anyway, that's, that's what the Bible says about it. So, okay, let's go on here. Um, so they, obviously they was pretty messed up and, uh, during, this, during this whole time. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. That's the good thing about God. God always gives space to repent, don't he? Behold, I will cast her into a bed with them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, okay? Uh, except they repent of their deeds. God leaves room for repentance. I'm thankful that he does. I'm going to tell you what, I'd be in, I'd be in bad shape if, if, uh, if, if they, God didn't give space for repentance. Now, verse 23, and I will kill her children with death. Now, during this time, there's something that you can read in your history books about called the Black Death. During, during all this, you know, during this time period here, this 500 to 1500. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. Now, I'm thankful that God put that in there, and I believe God put that in there because God knows the heart of a person more than he reads the sign on the building. We can't condemn everybody in every religion. Now, we can say, look, if their doctrines don't line up with the Bible, it's a false doctrine. But when, when, when God saves a person's soul, God looks on the heart. God don't look on the church sign. There'll be people, I'm sure, on the roll of Highway Baptist Church that is lost as a ball in tall weeds. They've been playing a game the whole time. But God looks on the heart. There'd be people saved in every... In, in, Possibly every religion and every denomination and every type of possibly, right? If they believe Jesus Christ as their Savior, if they trusted Christ as their Savior and asked Him for salvation, my goodness, the Bible says they're saved. I don't care what's on the sign or what the guy wears when he's standing up here. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm glad God looks on the heart. Amen. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. God says, I, I can single you out. I'm thankful that God can single out one person with a right heart in the midst of a bunch of people that ain't got a right heart. I'm thankful that God can single out one family. I'm thankful God can single out one church. In a world that is all about this Laodicean church age where it's all about me, if it don't feel good, I ain't going, all that kind of stuff, I'm glad that God can look down from heaven on Sunday morning and God can see a, a church that's doing its very best to stick to the Bible and, and to love people and to open its doors. And my, It don't matter who walks in here. It don't matter what they've done, what they look like, what color their skin is, if they got money, if they ain't got money, cops and robbers, and I mean, it don't matter. Once you come in here, it's a level playing field in here. They ain't no seniority in here. Ain't nobody better than nobody. Ain't no, there ain't no bosses and employees. Ain't none of that. This is a house of God right here. We're all guests in here. Amen. And we're all at the bottom, and he's at the top, and there ain't no in-betweens. Amen. And it's a level playing field. And you ain't got to have a pedigree. You ain't got to have church history. You ain't got to have a big pocketbook. You ain't got to have nothing. Amen. I'm all you got to have is air in your lungs and walk in. We, we appreciate people being alive when they get here. They may not leave alive, but we appreciate them being alive when they get here. Amen. He says, but I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira. He said, I like it. He said, they some down there that hadn't fell for all that. They some 
at that church that has stuck. They some during this time period that has stuck to their guns. They some that's doing right in this time period. Everybody ain't went and apostatized. Everybody hadn't went and fell for old Jezebel's fornication and all that kind. Everybody hadn't went for that. They still some folks that's doing right. Thank God. In America, I'm glad they still some folks that says, you know what? We don't need the devil's music. We don't need a different book. We don't need to, the pastor don't need to dress down and look like he's some reject from a boy band or something like that. We don't have to do it like everybody else does. Ain't you glad you pastor ain't wearing skinny jeans tonight? Amen. I mean, ain't you, ain't you glad that I'm not trying to look cool? Man, I give up on that. I, I ain't supposed to be cool. I'm a preacher. Amen. Now, I ought to look somewhat professional every time I walk in the building. Every time I'm doing business for the Lord, I ought to have an appearance about Of course, you know, all down at the hospital, I walk in there, and, I, and I've had to show up before in, in camos. I have. I've showed up for camouflage, you know, and, and, uh, and I always tell them, people who work at the hospital, I say, look, just forgive me. I'm the pastor. I know I don't look like it. Well, we're not here to judge. I told one down there at the hospital to pop up. I said, yeah, that's part of the problem in America today. Ain't enough judgment going on. Yeah, anybody can do anything, just dress any way away. Your know, pastor walking, he ought to have, he ought to, hey, man. I preached a, a, a friend of mine died, got stabbed to death back, I guess back summer, wasn't it? And, and, uh, me and, and Brother Greg Swan used to be his pastor. And uh, so me and Brother Greg went down there, and I was preaching that funeral. And there was me and Brother Greg when it walked in there. Both had suits and ties on. And uh, the guy that died, his daughter's pastor was there, Reed Obituary. He had on a pair of tennis shoes and blue jeans and a, and a shirt wasn't even tucked in. I told Brother Greg, we introduced ourselves to him. I said, I bet he felt, I would. I'd feel about that. Stand up, going to represent the Lord, looking like you just going to a backyard barbecue somewhere. Hey, man. Well, where was I? <laughs> something about something, wasn't it? At least I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, everybody hadn't fell for that, and which have not known the depths of Satan. Boy, thank God. As they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. He said, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to hold you accountable for somebody else's sins. Boy, thank God for that. Amen. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1 says, Therefore, brethren, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Amen. Hold fast. What you know, hold on to it. Amen. He that overcometh and keepeth my works. He didn't say words, did he? Works. Keepeth my works. That's what he said. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works works under the end. We ought to keep working. Christianity ain't a lazy man's thing. Now this modern day thing where you just come in and we'll, you know, we'll sing a little bit and make you feel good and you put your 20 bucks in the offering plate and you go on your merry way and, and, and do whatever you want and all this kind of stuff. No. He said, and keepeth my works. We ought to be working for the Lord. We sang a song, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. They used to put rest in peace on Christians' tombstones. Why? Because Christian life ought to be a work. Pastor Bible says man desires the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. Hey, man. It's a Bible says much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's work. It's work to be a Christian. It's work to live right. It's work to do right. It's work. Amen. It ain't a lazy man. If it was easy, everybody would do it. If it was easy, they'd call us Girl Scout. Amen. Just sell cookies. By the way, when is Girl Scout cookies easy? It ought to be coming up pretty quick because it's been a while since I've had some of them little coconut... They're out? Are they done selling them? If I ain't got no... Well, I need some. If y'all, no, I need some Girl Scout cookies. I don't care if they let boys in or not. I, want, I need some of them Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I'd compromise on that to get them little... What kind are they? They got the coconut? The what? Oh, yeah. yeah. Rightly named. We buy a tractor trailer load of them and hide them. And then about July triple the price and sell them, pay off our building. <laughs> Amen. 
They already tripled the price. Yeah, but, I mean, if ain't nobody else got none, put them on Amazon, man. He says, to him will I give power over the nations. 2 Timothy 2 and 12, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign. That's a millennial reign verse right there. Amen. thousand year reign. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Absolutely. And the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers. Now watch this. Here's what he says. It's talking about power. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Power. The vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. With his power, he says, even as I received of my father. Hmm. Not the father of Jezebel and them's bunch. That's a different father. <laughs> Amen. This capital F father. Amen. That's him. And I will give him the morning star. Jesus Christ is the morning star. That's all I know about that verse. I don't, I'm, it's another. Don't nobody else know either. Apparently. Nobody I know knows and nobody I got books after knows and nobody that they know knows. And I will give him the morning star. He that overcometh. If you've overcome, you've done got the morning star. So there's something to, some of these things for each church, I, I'm convinced now, some of these things for each church is stuff we just ain't going to be able to find much about till later. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Y'all got a Y'all got a song? Stand if you would.